Good evening, everyone. Okay, before we start, Marisa is reminding us that those that need tra translation to Portuguese, that uh, we have the, the that, whatever the name of that thing is. <laughs> Headset. Headset, okay. And uh, it's available over there, so just, uh, it's in the back there. Oh, okay. Em português. Todos entenderam, né? Mas vamos lá. Aqueles que precisam de tradução para o português, porque a palestra de hoje à noite, uma vez, uma, é nessa quinta-feira, especial de cada mês, vai ser em inglês. E, mas nós temos os headsets aí com a Marisa para aqueles que precisam de tradução. Ok? Muito bom. Uh, então, hoje... Ah, ok. Switching. <risos> So tonight we're going to be talking about the Four Noble Truths, and uh, you might be asking, so what is this? I never read it anywhere. You know, I know all the, uh, the books from Kardec and others, and what is it? Yeah, what is it? Okay, uh, this comes from the Buddha uh, philosophy, and uh, for a long time I have been meaning to talk about this because I, I, when I when I really uh, read, you know, through all these concepts we're going to review tonight, I, I saw some, it was really, uh, uh, it's so close, actually, so close what we have been uh, learning through Kardec that I thought, you know, uh, we could benefit from going through it. But the whole idea here is not really to get you guys converted into Buddhism, okay? Now, also, I don't want to pretend that you're going to be, uh, that I'm an expert in Buddha, and I don't want anybody uh, to, to see this as, a, as a, a lesson about Buddhism. What we're really looking for here is uh, to call our attention to the fact that our happiness depends a lot on how we see the world and life. And uh, you're going to see how it comes, uh, hopefully it's going to come very clear as we move on. But first we're going to talk about what we know in the spiritist uh, in, uh, doctrine side. Okay, we're going to start with this uh, screen here, this slide with no words. What I want you to, to think for a minute, you know, first of all, what is it you were looking at? You are looking at a couple, which you are going to say, you know, either the man or the, 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 the woman is one of you. Each of you is going to be sitting there for a minute. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a, a spirit that is doing a in, reincarnation plan. And uh, sitting by his or her side is his or her mentor, spiritual mentor. So they are sitting there in a nice place uh, where they can see our world, the earth, our planet, and they're talking about reincarnation. So that's you now, thinking about uh, what you want to see in that plan for reincarnation. So by now, of course, you are happy, uh, you, uh, you accept at least the fact that you're going to be reincarnating here on earth, and you've got to have a plan before you fly all the way over here. Okay, so, question, what were you thinking about at that particular moment? So you were planning on your reincarnation. Well, with that mentor, you know, he has done a great job working with you, and um, you're gonna say, well, it's gonna be tough, but doable. <coughs> So, yep, count on me, I'm going to reincarnate. I was going to say, and by the way, I'm not going to be alone. I'm going to have all the spiritual world I can tap on, I can call on them, I can pray for God, I can, do a, I can get the help that I need to survive in my next journey. Right? You're also going to think, you're going to thank God for the opportunity because it's not easy to reincarnate nowadays. I don't know if somebody told you that. 
it's complicated. There's too much competition in there. And uh, you got, you know, you got uh, the privilege to be, actually you've been blessed. You're going to have an opportunity to reincarnate it. You want to get the most of, of that opportunity. You've got all this um, training and education, and you were ready to come. Okay. Well, what have you signed up for at that moment? A lot of challenges, right? We're still happy. You knew that. You know that. And I, I'm talking about challenges, not problems. You know you're going to have a lot of challenges. But for what? Well, because you are working on your enlightenment, to use Buddha words here, you know, concepts. So, and then we're very happy to take the opportunity and come and have 60, 70, 80 years here in this world. And it's very clear in your mind at that point in time what's waiting for you. Okay. But why challenges and suffering? Why do we have to go through that? Fortunately, our doctrine is very rich, clear, in terms of explaining to us uh, everything that we need to know, where we came from, why we are here right now, and um, where can we possibly go after this? So you were not, we're not lost. You know, most people are. Also, um, we know the origins and the purpose of our challenges. So we're taking them up because we agree with them. We know where they, they came from. Correct? Okay, are you being able to go back 10 years before your reincarnation and remember all this? All right. And also, the Spiritism will tell you how to live a relatively happy life here, despite of all those challenges. In, when I say here, in this world of trials and expiations. Okay, so far so good. Oh, and how to secure, secure a better life upon your return, or in the next incarnation. Hopefully it's going to be in the next phase or stage of this world here, the regeneration world. Okay, so here's the, uh, the simple, to say, uh, process you're going to have to follow. You know you're going to face the challenges, but you're going to transform those challenges into opportunities. Because they are opportunities. The challenges that we, we are going to face here in this incarnation, uh, your upcoming incarnation, is uh, they, they are really opportunities for you to be better, for you to grow spirit, spiritually, morally. So you're very happy to take them. And once you transform that into, once you started to see them as opportunities as opposed to challenges, Everything changes. As I said, it all depends on how you see things. You know, you can see the negative side, you can see the positive side. In, in this particular case, uh, we are very, very accustomed here to look into the negative sides of our suffering. There is the positive side we never look at. Well, and then we, uh, we do know that there's suffering involved in it. But we're also going to be positive about it. We're going to take it as sacrifices. Things we're going to have to renounce, give up, give up. Things we're going to have to um, get by without. Uh, be deprived of certain things. Depending on your situation, your particular situation, what, how you came here, uh, to do what. But you know one thing. Uh, you're going to look at those uh, that suffering as the sacrifices that you have to do f for you to get what you came here to grab, to do, okay? And one of it is you want uh, education, you want lessons, you want to learn with your suffering or your opportunities, your sacrifices. 
because that's the only way you are going to get better morally and spiritually. You know, you're going to have to, you're going to go back at some point uh, with lessons learned and integrated to your soul, to your spirit. And then, of course, you're going to be ready for the blessings. Jesus said, you know, um, blessed are the, the afflicted people. They're going to be rescued. I, I don't know, we forgot the word in English. But we know that that's the route. Okay, so being, you know, reincarnation is a serious stuff, but it's, uh, it's, when we look into it, when you think about it, when you think about what we are here for, why we're going through all this from a different lens, then you will start to feel better because, you know, I just came to my mind here, maybe by inspiration, you know, think about Jesus carrying his cross up the hill. He never really dropped it, I mean, abandoned his cross in the middle of the road because he knew where uh, the golden pot, if you will, is or was. He needed to get to the top and go through what he did to get his blessings. Okay, uh, let's... Uh, Let's get the views of some important people here in our gospel. St. Augustine, you know, if you read um, his book before he died, I mean, before he became a saint, he was still here, year 1400-something, in the Confessions of St. Augustine, he used to be a, a writer you know, that would delight you, you know. He would be clear as possible, profound as possible, but very candidly, candidly, but also soft. I don't know what happened. He went to the other side, and he started to write like this. Let me read this to you. Is the earth a place of enjoyment and a paradise of delights? Does the voice of the prophet no longer echo in your ears? Did he not proclaim there would be whipping and grinding of teeth for those who were born into this valley, valley of pain? So then, all who live here must expect bitter tears and suffering, and no matter how acute or how deep the pain, lift up your eyes to heaven and offer thanks to the Lord for wishing to test you. So, it may sound a little bit too direct to the point, but at the end of the day, you know, what we were thinking of, what could we have expected? This, a world of trials and expiation, with everything that's and it's entailed to that. Another um, spirit that wrote in the Gospel, uh, Francois de Genève, um, this one is a, a little lighter, but then he said about melancholy. Do you know why sometimes a vague sadness fills your heart, leading you to consider that life is bitter? This is because your spirit, aspiring to happiness and liberty on finding itself tied to the physical body which acts like a prison becomes exhausted through vain efforts to seek release. On recognizing that these attempts are useless, the soul becomes discouraged, tired, apathetic, full of hopelessness, and it is then that you judge yourself to be unhappy. Okay, and this is, uh, uh, have to put this thing into context. You know, it, even if you go back to those spirits that were in exile here from Capella, right? 
So they had a lot of melancholy, angsty, and other things because they knew better. And their spirits knew better. There was a better world. And they were here tied to their bodies. And although the conscious part of their minds did not know it, they were sort of uh, depressed because they were tied to this and there was no way out. So here, there's a book from um, Hermès Dufault called um, Listening to Your Sentiments or something like that. That will talk about the, uh, the fact that we all come over here with profound psychological um, wounds from the previous life. And uh, because we're not perfect spirit, because we've been working, suffering, going through all this challenge, we are tired and exhausted. We come over here like that. And the whole thing is about, you know, forget about all that. And that's, thank God, we, we don't come over here with our full memories uh, flowing through, you know, the um, conscious part of your, of your mind. Uh, it's a good idea that we don't remember that because part of the thing that would uh, tie, you know, would very, very difficult for us to handle was this uh, innate um, desire not to be here. But that's, we are going to overcome all this once we're done with this uh, incarnation and this world and everything is going to be okay. However, it's part of the, uh, the challenge along the road that we uh, overcome all those uh, feelings of not wanting to, to face the situation. Okay, what about happiness? In the, in the short side, short view of this, happiness is something that we all aspire. Whoever you are, we all want to be happy. And you would be happy to the fullest extent. We want to be happy to the fullest extent in this world on Earth. And everybody wants that, with exceptions, of course. But what about the higher level view of happiness? And this comes from Joana de Angelis. Our spirits have been created to reach perfection and happiness. So we know our destination, we just don't know uh, how long it's going to take because part of it depends on how fast we're going to work, how hard we're going to work. But we know we, we are one way or the other. There's no way. We are going to be always brought, you know, brought back on track in the direction of the celestial worlds. It's going to take long, but we don't need to, to uh, to be counting on this, to be happy, as we're going to see here. We are all here on Earth to work on our development so that we can eventually reach a state of sublime happiness. So we need to be aware that we are here to work on our spirit. The purpose of reincarnations is to give us the opportunity to uh, work on our uh, weaknesses, learn with our challenges, and exceed our present limitations. So that's according to Joana de Angelis. So we're tying back to this to the very beginning, and we're trying to understand uh, the things that we may know, but we tend to forget. Why am I going? Why is this have? Why is this this way? Why does it have to be so difficult? Well, then uh, on, there's this thing here from another spirit that I cannot read, Francois Nicolas, Nicolas Madeleine, in the Gospel as well, that says, I'm not happy. Happiness was not made for me. So this is general public saying uh, uh, that. And then, and then he goes on and says, say, uh, those are the things that men uh, say wherever he is in terms of his uh, social positions. 
That, my dear sons, is the best proof among all possible proofs for this highest truth. Happiness is not for this world. Okay. There is relative happiness. We don't know what happiness is and we won't know for a long time. All we can do is to be relatively happy. So for us, it's going to be great. We don't know better, right? Joana de Angelis then say, true happiness before anything is that we are alive. So the first thing is, I should be happy for the simple fact that I'm here taking opportunity of another reincarnation so I can keep working on my spirit and being in, get better prepared and get closer to Jesus, get closer to the true happiness. So being alive is enough for us to be happy, according to Joana de Angelis, and I think uh, most of us, if not all of us, would agree with that. And we are conscious of our weaknesses and fragilities. Well, this is the statement, you know, you know some, this is a profile of somebody that knows all that. But we have to ask our questions to ourselves. Do we know what our weaknesses are? Because we need to know so that we can work on that. And then it goes on, she goes on and say, and aware of the infinite possibilities of moral progress that comes from our courage to seek enlightenment. So it sums up, you know, what we're trying to, been trying to say here as far as what we are doing here, what we're looking for, what have I signed up to. All right, then there was this guy, Siddhartha Gautama, I have no idea how better to pronounce that. And uh, I think that's good enough, right? Yeah. Okay. And he was the Buddha. He was around here like 500 years, 500 years before Christ. And uh, he was the son of a, a king. Not a big king, but it was a king. And he lived uh, for several years up until his earliest 20s. Uh, he lived in, uh, in, uh, in this kingdom, right? Where Everything was controlled, so the whole idea was that he was not, he should not see, be in touch, and, 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 and feel whatever, anything other than happiness, other, anything that was good. So uh, nothing was being showed, or shown, I'm sorry, to Buddha that would bring him down. And, but one day he managed to get out of this kingdom, and he saw on the streets an old man Okay, an old man walking down the street. A man with uh, illness, a very sick man. And then he had not seen those things. Then a deceased man, somebody that died, was a funeral. And then a ascetic. Ascetic is that kind of guy like a monk. Mm -hmm. Well, he said, there's another world and maybe this is the real world. Okay, Siddhartha then understood that suffering was part of life, was part of the, the vision for life. So life included suffering, was part of it. He then relinquished, gave up on all his privileges as the son of the king, became a monk, and decided to understand the truth of at one point, you know, he spent several weeks, some 40 days, somebody say under the tree, I don't know exactly where, he was meditating about life and his own life. That was his point of awakening. Buddha, by the way, means enlightened, enlightened. Well, he then left us with uh, some very good stuff, very profound philosophies. And Everything is based or started with uh, the Four Noble Truths. And that's where the name, you know, now you're relating to the title of the, uh, the presentation tonight, of the studies tonight, was the essence. So the Four Noble Truths are the foundations uh, of his philosophy. It's uh, the four truths or realities, if that helps you understand it better. One of them 
is the existence of suffering as part of life. So suffering is part of life. And here suffering means all sort of suffering from a, a very light uh, in, inner conflict to the most difficult pain or mental illness, everything from the smallest to the, to the biggest. The second truth was there was a cause for suffering. So suffering was not here uh, without a cause. And then the next foundation is the cessation of suffering. So suffering is something that can be stop it, eliminated, release it from. And then the last one is actually uh, something that's going to unfold in eight pieces that's called the Eightfold Path, that is the path that's going to lead to enlightenment. So that's the, we're going to see if it's very interesting, what is it that we need to do to get to enlightenment? Before that, uh, just a little bit more about background. So uh, the root cause of all suffering, according to Buddha, is not two things, craving and ignorance. Craving, everybody knows what craving is? Okay. It's this intense desire, passion, you, something you can't stop. So craving for sense, pleasures, craving to be and craving not to be. And uh, we're gonna talk about the definition in a minute. Also, ignorance, which really means here a misunderstanding or lack of a full understanding of the nature of the self and nature of reality, life. Of course, in the spiritism side, we, uh, we know that we have all been created uh, simple and ignorant and, put a, and we're put on a, uh, on a long journey through a series of reincarnation where we're gonna move from simple and ignorant all the way to being prepared for God, purified, enlightened. And also, the Spiritism is gonna, you know, it talks about attachment to material and uh, spiritualization where it also do two ways to look into our journey, you know, from a pure materialistic view on feelings and way of thinking and everything to no material at all, to highly spiritualized people. And that's the education of the soul. Buddha also spoke about karma just like we understand it, you know, the consequences of good and bad actions during our life of, during the life of the spirit, not just this life, but during the life of the spirit. We know how it works. He also spoke about uh, reincarnation. And he uh, said there was uh, six types or six categories of worlds. Two where the suffering was uh, felt the most. And we know through the spiritism, he's talking about the uh, primitive world and this world. Then there's a world that is kind of in between where you take a little break still going to suffer, but not as much. It's going to be a lot easier. And uh, we call that, in the Spiritism uh, doctrine, what? Regeneration, right? And then there are, well, here's, uh, he talks about uh, an additional three different worlds all the way up. And I think we'll just talk about two, but that's okay. You know, at the end of the day, Kardec was saying that this is just for education purposes, so there's a continuum of worlds all the way up from bottom to, to the top. Okay, the first uh, noble truth is about the existence of suffering. So one of the definitions of uh, somebody from the Buddhism is saying, when one abides inflamed by desire, feeling restrained, so you want but you can't, or it's too difficult, you feel obsessed to have it, you also contemplate the gratification of that. 
Oh, this is going to be wonderful. This is how I'm going to feel once I get it. Well, that's when one's bodily, uh, bodily and mental troubles increase. One's bodily and mental torments increase, and one's bodily and mental fevers increase. So, uh, there is suffering, and it's linked, however, to your desires and ignorance. In the Spiritist book, the Spiritist book, the Spirit's book uh, question 614, which is the first question on the third part, which is about moral laws, uh, we have the clarification from these spirits that men only suffer when they distance themselves from the natural laws, from the divine laws. Which is, you know, above saying whenever you go after these material things, you are distancing yourself from God. All right, there's still uh, number two about the origin of suffering. Uh, one way they, they explain this is through the three poisons. One of them is craving for the sense pleasures, as we touched a minute ago. It's the craving for the objects, the material things of this world which provide what? Pleasant feelings. And, um, or craving for sensory pleasures. So we're talking about our five senses. So we, when we only look into our body, we want to make our body happy, okay? We are talking about the things that will make, that will come through us, will make sense to us through our five senses, right? Okay, everybody here has five senses? Okay, good. Uh, then there is uh, craving for, craving to be. That's very interesting. So we also crave to become something, to limit or to unite with an experience. So we want to be part of an experience. We want to become something. We want to be that experience. We want to be in the middle of that. This includes a solid and ongoing, a continued craving to being someone with a past and a future and uh, to prevail and, and, and dominate over others. So craving to be, we crave to be something, we crave to be more important, we crave to be more, uh, I don't know, uh, eloquent. We crave to be a lot of things. So that's the, uh, the origin number two, craving to be. Of course, it doesn't apply to anybody here, but applies to a lot of people outside, right? Everybody's trying, is craving to be something that they are not. Or craving not to be. And this is craving not to experience the world, not to be part of the bad stuff. So when it comes to, to share or to experiment these things that are not very pleasurable, I crave not to be. I'm not here, I'm gone. So that's the craving not to be. So you want to get everything that's good and not or none of what is bad. Okay. Still on the origin of suffering, you know, those were the cravings. Now there's the ignorance side. So we're talking about ignorance of self and of life and about karma and the cycle of birth uh, and rebirth. So we have, we ignore uh, we have this ignorance about the truth of ourselves and life. The Spiritists will say, you know, we will remind us that Jesus said, know the truth, and the truth will save you. So, know what you need to know to be happy, know what you need to know to progress in life, to come closer to me, because I am the way to God. Okay, the other way to look at the uh, origin of the suffering is, uh, is just uh, the same thing, but uh, you know, this portrayed a little bit different. You know, ignorance, which is the misunderstanding of nature of reality, attachment to all the pleasurable experiences, and aversion, which is this uh, same as craving not to be, which is the fear of getting what we don't want. Okay. The truth number three was about the cessation of suffering. It refers to the cessation of craving, which keeps us tied to suffering. 
It's the only, it is only through the development of, of our true understanding of the causes of suffering, they are rooted on craving and ignorance, that one can find liberation from suffering. So if anybody here is trying to find, you know, find a way out of suffering, have to work on those two things. Have to work on uh, getting, more, I mean, smarter, clever, and more intelligent about what Jesus said. Know the truth, and the truth will save you. Remember that the Spiritism uh, taught us a lot about the, the law of cause and effect. Right? It's the uh, Buddha called it karma, and we call it something else, not to get confused with Buddhist, but uh, everything goes back to the cause, to the law of cause and effect. Okay. The fourth path is the path to cessation of suffering, and this is the eighth additional path. Okay, so the fourth path actually converts into eight. Uh, that's going to lead you from freedom to suffering. And here are the eight elements of the eight fold. Right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, light effort, uh, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Okay. Um, let's go and take a look at it. But once you're done with that, that's what you expect. Once you've mastered all those eight steps, you're ready to knock the door. Of whom? At least Jesus Christ, right? And then he's going to take you to God. So, correct view. So we're not going to touch on those eight. We, the, eighth, uh, the Eighth Fold will talk about correct view, an accurate understanding of the nature of things, specifically the Four Noble Thrusts. So having a clear understanding of the nature of life, of nature of things, of nature of you, uh, and, and, and everything. Correcting intention, which is avoid thoughts of attachment hatred and harmful intent. So we have to have this correct intent. Correct speech, refraining from refraining from verbal mindset, mind deeds, misdeeds, I'm sorry, such as lying, size, uh, divisive speech, harsher speech, and senseless speech. So whenever we speak we, we talk, okay? We talk the truth. We talk what is going to, uh, it reminded of Emmanuel for a minute, you know, when he said, well, if you don't, if somebody is, is fighting or offending you or something like that, if you don't have anything to say, keep quiet. So here is the other side of that. So if you are gonna talk, uh, don't do it in a way that's gonna hurt. Maybe you want to take a couple of that and take to your husbands and wives, right? Okay, all of a sudden we started to have some difficulties here. Cor correct action, refraining from physical misdeeds, such as killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. So we're part of a society. We are here to live wi with each other. We're here to love each other. And uh, by correct action, we're just talking about living in peace and loving each other. The other four, correct livelihood, avoiding trades that directly or indirectly harm others, such as selling slaves, weapons, animals, and drugs and such. This is a put, of course we put this in a way that's more, I mean, easier to, in, as a first path, pass to understand it. But it's more profound, it's a little profound, you know, more profound than that. So, uh, living in this world, you know, correct lively, uh, livelihood as a person with high moral standards, right? That treat each other as brother, that do 
uh, the care about all that is compassionate. So that those things go all in there. Correct effort, abandoning negative states of mind and have already, you know, that's already in there and preventing negative states of that have yet to, uh, to, to come, to arise and sustaining the positive states. Correct mindfulness, which is awareness. Awareness of the body, feelings, thought, and everything that happens in life, the way life man manifests itself to us. Uh, mindfulness, be mindful. Somebody tells you, oh, be mindful of this. Say, well, be alert, be fully aware. Be there at the moment and understand what you're doing. Be careful. And concentration or focus. Okay. Now we're done with that. We went through the eight paths. We understand all that. And we, uh, we passed the tests. Guess what? We get to a state that he calls nirvana. So if you want to tell somebody that you are in this sublime state of peacefulness and everything else, oh, I feel like I'm in that state of nirvana. <coughs> Have you done that yet? OK, we're going to do it. So nirvana is a spiritual state after ex extinction of all the causes of suffering in which we are all rooted in craving and ignorance. So then you get to the state of nirvana, you're ready, very enlightened. So you are released from reincarnation. You see, when I'm talking to you about you know, this philosophy, and it sounds perfectly like I'm talking about Kardec and stuff, different perhaps nomenclature, different you know, way or, or names to things, but it's, it's there. And, and also he says, Nirvana can be in this life, and it's going to be partial nirvana, what we call relative, uh, uh, being relatively happy. And, of course, nirvana after the material life. Okay. So, what were you thinking? Right? So, we go all the way back to that minute. As I said, If we change the way we view things, then we change everything. You know, when it comes to my mind, um, an example from a textbook, that the guy uh, was leaving his back door and he saw a dog uh, in his mind was causing some damage to his one of his bushes over there, and, and then uh, he gets mad, and then he looks for the first stone, so I'm going to kill that dog. As he got closer, he notes that actually the dog just got strained there. Uh, he, he got locked into something that was there, and he couldn't leave. And he was not destroying anything. He was just trying to get rid of whoever, whatever was tying him down to that bush. And then he changed completely. And said, oh, poor dog. Let me help you. And so, and then it's uh, it's always the way you look. How, the way you feel, the way you're going to interpret. That's why not everything that I'm telling you, you are getting it exactly how I intend it to be. Because what I say doesn't really get internalized by you before it goes through some filters. Your uh, paradigms, the way your lens, if you will. And that is life as well. So we can look at life as uh, something that it's not worth it. Or you can look at it as you say, oh, boy, I'm going to accomplish a lot in this incarnation, particularly if I start doing this and that and that and that and that. And if I work on all those other things, whoa, what an opportunity. And that's the reason why I brought this here, because I wanted another view from one of the uh, predecessors of Jesus Christ, putting the thing that Jesus Christ came in later on when he said, I'm here not to destroy the law, right, uh, of, the uh, of Moses and the prophets. 
but to live it, to show you. And the Buddha was definitely one of them. So, now we're back to that bench, talking to your uh, mentor, and you're telling him, wow, this guy is Gilberto, you know, he opened up my eyes. Now I'm even more prepared to go on this journey because I understand better what expects me, how I'm supposed to see those challenges, transforming challenges into opportunities and sacrifices and then into education for my spirit. And then when I come back, I'm going to come back very tired, when I need a vacation, but the blessings, the rewards are going to be uh, well merited, would be wonderful. So to finalize, we have uh, St. Augustine again that said, and by the way, this is on the chapter three that's talk about the many mansions in the, in the, in the universe of my father or in the house of my father. And he's explaining, at the time of your nightly resting, so when you go to bed and when you're going to say your prayer, Look at the innumerable spheres shining over your heads up there. Start, start to imagine that. And question your, you know, yourselves which ones might lead to God. And ask Him to one such a world that that world would open the doors to you. As the, after our trials and expiations on earth, once we're done with the, our trials and expiations. So it's very clear. We can close our eyes and ears, but not forever. We are not here on vacation. We can be happy here, yes, to the extent that we understand our challenges and we take it as opportunities for growth. So. With that, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.